All right. Hello, hello, everyone. It's Lydia. I'm here with my friend, Brian Hoyer, who uh, we haven't chatted in a while, but um, we kind of go way back. Let's see, 20... Mm, 15, maybe? At yeah. The conference? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So we met in person at a conference for the Nutritional Therapy Association. I think we were online friends before that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And then we had a, some hangouts when you were here doing some tours for your EMF uh, consults, right? Back in, um, I want to say it was like 2018, 2017, something like that. Yep. Yeah. Around then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyways, Brian is here to help us break down this whole EMF exposure conundrum that we're all collectively facing so that we can understand it better and um, start like checking off the to-do list to reduce harm and protect ourselves and really understand it comprehensively because there's a lot of stuff out there that's like, oh, I could try this or this. And it's maybe not necessarily the best first step or even all that helpful. So we're gonna really get into it today. So thanks for being here, Brian. Is there anything else you wanna let people know about you really quick? Well, I, I kind of have a similar background to Lydia in that um, in the nutrition realm and ancestral health and um, eating nutrient dense whole foods and just coming from that practitioner standpoint of helping clients. And so that that's been kind of a different angle for the EMF world than what they're used to, because a lot of the uh, people that have gotten into this in the past are just people that are interested in electricity and how buildings are wired and and things like that. And they're kind of coming at it from an electrical engineering standpoint. And uh, that's kind of what Shielded Healing has brought to the table with this is understanding it more from a human physiology standpoint and an ancestral standpoint and kind of understanding more that, uh, you know, we, we know we kind of have good ideas about what the ancestral diet was like and what maybe some of the practices were like. But our, our environment now is much different than what our ancestors' environment was, especially energetically. But also you think of all the toxicities and the, the pollution and everything that, that we're breathing in and we're exposed to on our skin and products we use and things like that. Um, but then the invisible things going through the air, that's a whole other factor. And, and, and then there's also visible types of EMF like artificial light that mm. are having a huge impact on our health that are modern stressors that are created in ways that we've never, you know, humans had never been exposed to these types of lights before at these pulsations yeah. and everything. So the, the 30,000 foot view is how do we get <laughs> back to what humans bodies are used to in this, on this planet, uh, because we've created a mini alien environment that our bodies are like, what the heck is going on here? So that's, that's the 30,000 foot, foot viewpoint. And that's the question that it's always kind of permeating my mind is, yeah, how do we get back to what our bodies are supposed to be in? Like, what's the optimal habitat for humans? If we had a, you know, the, the analogy I like to like to, uh, to use with people is um, if we had a exhibit in the zoo, what would the zookeepers want to be our diet? And what would they want our environment to be like? And uh, that's something that zookeepers are always asking about the capuchins and the geckos and, you know, all the different and the elephants and the giraffes and the gorillas, all these animals that they're taking care of. They're like, OK, we have to get it's like really important. We have to give them their ancestral diet, what they eat in, the, in nature. And we also have to try to recreate this habitat so that they can it can be more natural like. But mm -hmm. when it comes to humans, we have kind of completely forgotten about that, it seems. Yeah. Oh, for sure. It's like we could end all the diet wars if we like spent way more time thinking about environment, right? Because it's like, okay, let's uh, let's look at the big picture. So yeah, I love that. I love the 30,000 foot view. I love to go laser out because we're, we get so myopic on things. So like we know 5G is a big problem too, in addition to all the other uh, forms of EMFs, which we're going to talk about. Um, but like, how do you eat an elephant? Yeah. One bite at a time. <laughs> so that's, that's what we need to do. So 
that's why this is important too. Like this is a really big, huge and daunting topic. And I've had many conversations with people who are literally like afraid, you know, and you know, some people have horrific reactions. Um, and so the fear can be very real in, in that it's like, it's affecting them. Right. Um, but it is important for us to come into this topic with, with some, you know, like, okay, we're going to educate, we're going to understand, and then there's stuff we can do. So we're not living in that fear and letting it like hold us back in any way. Um, and I think of what's that saying, like with Fred Rogers must've said it when there's like some trauma in the world. And he said, when there's trouble like this, I look for the helpers. Um, you'll always find people who are helping. And that's Mm -hmm. why I wanted to bring Brian here because this has been your area. It's been your thing. And you have been a great source of help. And so that's the thing guys, is there's so many people out there educating, teaching, helping, um, so we can learn and and take action. So we're going to dive in, right? (laughs) Um, Yeah. So um, in this episode, we're going to assume that people are aware that 5G and EMFs are a huge hit to our physical health and well-being. But I do want a quick review just to, you know, frame out the conversation. Um, Like, so help people understand, like, why do we need to protect ourselves from 5G Um, like what are the dangers and what are the health symptoms? Sure. So the, the, the basic reason that you need to protect yourself from 5g is the same reason that you would need to protect yourself from, uh, poison in your food is that your body does not recognize these frequencies and not just 5g. It's also the 4g frequencies and the 3g frequencies and the electricity that that's in our homes it doesn't recognize that as something that's that's helpful or natural in in the in the environment on this planet that we live on and so when the the earth you know the basic the basic understanding of electricity in the body is that the earth is a dc current which means direct current and the electricity that we pulse and use in our homes is a is a pulsed and it's uh it's alternating current or ac electricity and that never existed on the planet before the late 1800s when Nikolai Tesla uh, invented alternating current electricity and beat out Thomas Edison's and Westinghouse's uh, DC electricity. And so the, uh, the, this environment that we're in is causing a stress response in the body, these pulsations and things that use, you know, the frequencies that are healing are, are the DC currents. Our body actually runs on this DC energy. And so when, when we have these pulsations from the electricity in the walls, that's a lower frequency, but it's still pulsing at 50 or 60 Hertz, depending on where you live in the world. And then we have wireless frequencies that are pulsing through the air. And that did not exist before the late 1800s as well. And so like shortly after electricity was developed, then you have these pulsations that were developed. And along with that, we have the, this, uh, t- this technical, technological revolution that was happening, the industrial revolution. There are so many things rapidly changing in the world that you know the medical world was kind of going bonkers. Like what the heck is causing, there's all these new illnesses, chronic illnesses coming up. And like in the 1900s, like all the way through 2000s, there's like, arise in so many different types of illnesses it was and so many different advances in different industries that it was kind of hard to sift through all the data and say well what's the what's the one cause of all of this well guess what there wasn't one cause it was a multitude of things that that were happening and emfs were kind of something that was just glazed over as something people just it just went right over their head they didn't even think about this but the fact is is that there are you know after basically, you know, the ability to study this for, for near, for like over 120 years now. And there was, there were, there was a lot of experiments with electricity before that, but not alternating current electricity. But after studying this for, for a long period of time, they realized that there is uh, detrimental physiological reactions that happen. And 
if you just think about the basics of how electricity works, like our, our experience with electricity as kids, you go down a slide and there's static electricity, right? So you go down a slide and you touch your brother or sister and you try to shock them or your parent or whatever. Like I did it to my parents a lot and, and they would like have this huge reaction when I was a kid. And so, and, and sometimes you can get it to where, where the, the spark will arc between the two people and you can actually see the spark. But like, that's, you know, that, that one spark was one pulse of electricity, but it was a direct current that's flowing in one direction. Once it's done, it's done. Pulsating electricity would be as if it was zapping back and forth. Da, 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 and that's just something that doesn't happen in nature. So, mm. uh, but, you know, electricity, it's, it, and then another experience you might, you might think of is, when, uh, when somebody restarts a heart in, in the movies, hopefully you haven't been around this somebody when they've had a heart attack and experienced it firsthand, but you, you see them restart a heart, they have to pump voltage in the heart and cause that muscle to contract. So voltages cause muscles to contract and, re- and, then, and then it lets go and it relaxes and the vol- voltage goes in a different direction. So there's this constant, when we have these pulsations all around us, there's this constant micro pulsations that are going on all the time in our body when we're exposed to these pulsing electric fields and that happens in probably 99.9% of homes all night long while you're sleeping and so these micro pulsations happening uh, on your body with with this 50 or 60 hertz electricity and then there's uh, different frequencies that are resonating through the air that are also pulsing and those and those cause different uh, different phenomena to happen in your body, where your body is resonating at this mm. higher frequency that it doesn't normally resonate at if you didn't have this exposure. And and so the symptoms from this are many, and the cellular reaction to this whole thing is that it crosses these uh, crosses the the membrane of the cell on these voltage gated calcium ion channels and potassium channels and and uh, sodium channels, and it causes an inflammatory response to happen. There's this, this uh, molecule that happens, this inflammatory molecule called peroxynitrite. And if there's nitric oxide present in the cell and uh, calcium is let in, this molecule is created. And when that happens, it causes this inflammatory reaction in the body. And so anywhere where you already have current inflammation, you probably have this going on, but the EMF propagates it, perpetuates it and makes it worse. So the symptoms are many, like the, one of the number one symptoms is insomnia. Um, there's also fatigue, ringing in the ears, heart palpitations, brain fog. A lot of the issues that you, that you hear from modern society that have kind of just sprung up in the last, last uh, you know, hundred years or so, uh, but more so as the EMF has gotten worse and the environment's gotten worse and the pollution has, you know, the, the air that we're breathing in is, is bad. So um, it's, you know, any, any symptom that you have can be related to mm-hmm. an EMF stressor, just like any type of emotional stress can bring, them up, bring up symptoms. Any, any kind of stress on the body can create almost any type of symptom because it's acting mm-hmm. on uh, inflammation pathways in the body that have to do with your fight or flight system um, and the inability to detox and if you're in a stressed state, you, you can't detox. And so you're going to have more symptoms. Yeah. It's like we've been the frog in the pot of boiling water ever since we've been alive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. That's right. Oh, man. There's actually a book called The Boiling Frog Syndrome. Uh-huh. And it's, it's all about uh, environmental stressors and, and especially EMF stressors. Ooh. Yeah. Well, there you go. The good so one. that's a good a good resource to check out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I like that. Wow. Okay. So, all right. So, yeah. And so one of the things, obviously, you know, that I'm interested in is this whole minerals and magnetism aspect and just people don't even realize this. I think we take our bodies for granted. Uh, we never were taught this, I think by design. Um, so we have the autonomic nervous system is literally conducted by electrolytes and minerals. 
And we've got, you know, the other piece is, hey, by the way, we haven't had minerals in our soil. It's not in our water anymore. So therefore not our food. So we're all kind of running low, <laughs> deficient or not optimal there. And then you add in this electrical stressor on top of already depleted state. So I think for me, it's really important to make this connection um, to my clients because we're doing all this work, supporting their system to remineralize, but then you're exposed, right? To all of these things. So mm -hmm. um, to me, that's really huge. Um, I don't know if you want to expound on that at all beyond what you shared. Yeah, I can. Um, and then I have a few questions on your end that I'd like to ask you about that too. Yeah, okay. So um, the, uh, if we understand like matter in the world, uh, every, every, all of matter is made up of minerals and, and minerals, every single mineral has a relationship with electromagnetic fields. They, they're either diamagnetic, paramagnetic, or there's one more that I'm not, that's not coming to my mind right now, but there's three different relationships that you, that you have with magnetic fields. And it basically, it either, the mineral either aligns with the magnetism or it mm -hmm. disaligns from it. And so any type of pulsing magnetic or electromagnetic field that you have has even a, if it even has a slight effect on a molecule inside of a cell, don't you think that that would possibly affect that cell if you have like a huge pulsating field that's pulsating back and forth? And that's what the, the, uh, the electromagnetic fields do. They pulse 120 times per second back and forth. And so I haven't verified this, but one of the um, things that I've thought about is, you know, like some of these old videos, even newer videos you have of un where you're looking under a microscope at something in the body, a red blood cell or some kind of little protozoa or, you know, even little, little creatures that, that you see under a microscope. And it kind of always seems like it's shaky. It's always, it's always shaky. It's like things are shaking on the whole screen and like, yeah, that's just the way life is there. But <laughs> the only time we look at these creatures, <clears throat> to my knowledge, is when they're exposed to this 50 or 60 hertz pulsating electromagnetic field and they're not protected from, from those pulsations. So you, you're looking at it under this microscope that's got an electric field like blasting right into this, this uh, the, the lens. And and everything that you're looking at is is in is in this electromagnetic soup, and so the question I have would be, you know, if if we were in a shielded environment where the where where the red blood cells or whatever we're looking at under the microscope mm. is is uh, protected, would we still be seeing the same kind of movements, or would we be seeing different movements? And that's something that one of one of you uh, biologists listening to this. Uh, yes we'll have to set up and, yeah. and maybe I could help you do that. But, um, but yeah, every single mineral that's in the body has a relationship with magnetism. It either aligns or disaligns with, with the magnetic field. And some, some connections are, or some, uh, some reactions are stronger than others. So we even have like a, a, a mineral called magnetite that's in, that's in the brain. And that's what the what birds use to orient themselves in the right direction when they're migrating. And humans have this too. That's why some people have a really strong sense of direction, like where where they where they can go when they're navigating out on the road. Um, but then every mineral also has different varying uh, resistance or conductivity, which means that electricity can move faster along the along along different pathways in the body. And so. Uh, my like and one of one of the the most conductive mineral is um there's silver and gold and then there's copper which is like a like the third and uh and so my question for you is in the body what happens what 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 are competing minerals with copper mm. that that make it so that our bodies are less conductive which means they're not going to be working <clears throat> as well the spark plugs aren't, 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 uh, firing as they should. Yeah. And, and, uh, you know, the, the impact I'm thinking that that probably has on the body is that things just aren't, just don't work as well. Right. Metabolically and, right. uh, and everything. So 
what are those relationships? Knowing that copper is the most conductive, what, what, are, what are some problems that people have when they ha don't have enough copper? Oh, yeah. So, well, so copper has a couple uh, things that can easily antagonize it enough um, that, you know, it makes it hard for us to have enough usable copper, right? And there's a lot of reasons why some people might need more than others. Like, so there's a lot of bio-individual nuance that we can't get into, but two top, like, antagonists, if you will, would be zinc and iron. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a big can of worms. I, I, if I know your brain at all here, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, like, like in the last two years, everyone's like slam and zinc. Um, since the time I've been alive, we've been fortifying foods with iron, um, not healthy forms of iron, mind you, like literal iron shavings and our freaking cereal. Hello. Yep. Um, so, so yeah, so that's going to be affecting the copper balance. We also don't eat ancestral diets, all of us. So we're not getting the copper from like organ meats or, or maybe we're not digesting and absorbing the copper because we don't have enough hydrochloric acid, but copper is very complex. We don't need a lot of it, but it's a big player because of how it helps with like the oxygenation of the mitochondria. So, mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I know I've read very, and I don't know a lot, very little was that the EMF piece and the 5G piece affects our ability to oxygenate, right? Our cells? Yeah, cellular respiration um, is, is halted by some of these inflammatory molecules. There's the peroxynitrite, there's carbonyl free radicals, which is a different pathway that, that happens mainly with um, ionizing radiation, but they found that it also happens with non-ionizing radiation. And that's, that's kind of a key factor too um, mm. with this is that um, for years, the conventional wisdom that's out there uh, is teaching that only ionizing radiation can be damaging to the human body uh, simply because of the idea from a physicist standpoint that it can't move an ion off, 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 of, uh, off of its place. And, and so but that's not the only way the EMFs impact the body or can impact your health. If you right. think of it, like light is a non-ionizing type of radiation and uh, blue light is a non-ionizing type of radiation, but it has a profound effect on your melatonin production. And so, you know, the idea that, that, uh, that a non-ionizing type of EMF can't be damaging or can't negatively impact the body that's just blown out of the water with that one example yeah. and it's 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 not about what, how if it can cause cancer within five minutes ten minutes or a year it's about does it affect the natural processes and yeah. cause a deviation from those natural processes <laughs> that then can cause a domino effect in for your health in other ways where yeah hey, I'm losing half an hour of REM sleep every night or deep sleep every night because of this EMF exposure. And over time, how does that affect you? Mm -hmm. you, know, you you'll be depleted of minerals and other nutrients because of that. Uh, you're not as restored. You don't feel as energetic when you, when you wake up. So there's a number of things that, that happen when you have these inflammatory um, mm -hmm. instigators in your environment that are going to in fact impact how you how you feel on a daily basis yeah it's huge i mean just having that oxygenation to help carry what we need throughout our whole system get it into the blood have that good blood flow mm -hmm. um i don't think anyone has good blood flow circulation anymore it's like everyone seems to be struggling with this right um so, but we're not aware. We're just not aware. Um, so yeah, I'm sure we could talk about this all day, but I hope people are doing their due diligence and educating themselves even more. Um, Brian just mentioned a cool book. Can you say it again? Oh, the boiling frog syndrome. 
Whirling Frog Syndrome. So it's a book that you can read to learn more. Now we know it's it's going to cause complications in our in our physical health. So what are we going to what are we going to do about it? First, you've told me a number of types of EMFs. Can we get can we kind of like do a list? Um you you said that in nature we have a certain type of current that's normal, but in the man-made electricity it's it's not conducive to human health. I think it's because of the like voltage of it, right? And it causes you to lose minerals. Yeah, yeah. The frequency and the pulsations are the unnatural things. And, okay. uh, and that causes a stress response that, that can make you lose minerals. It can cause contractions. Like when you, when you hook up voltage to stimulate your muscle, there's involuntary muscle contraction. Like when you, when you even, if you're an electrician, you know about like how, when you grab something that's uh, that's live with electricity and you get electrocuted, what happens? All your muscles start to start to flex. And so right. when that, when that happens, what's happening with minerals? Well, you've got this reaction between calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, all of these, all of these things are being shaken like crazy and, uh, and depleted and used up. And so right. calcium typically causes a muscle to contract and magnesium causes it to relax. And so the contraction uses up calcium, the relaxation uses up magnesium. And both of those are actions. A lot of times we don't think of the relaxation as using energy, but when you let go of something, there's muscles used to let go and to, to stop that contraction. And so there's, there's, uh, there's minerals that are used up in that process as well. And so just cause you're relaxed doesn't mean that you're not using up minerals. Um, you know, the, yeah. the, the act of relaxing in that transition period uses up some minerals that you need to be able mm -hmm. to relax. Otherwise you'd still be, if you ever have a tight muscle, you know what it's like, like your muscles tight and you can't relax it. And right. a lot of times that's because you're, you're deficient in something or there's some tissue damage that's happened that your body can't repair right away. Yeah. Or people are walking around literally not relaxed at all and totally tight. Yep. I yeah. mean, that's pretty much very normal. And right? that takes a lot of energy. That's how exhausting is it when yeah. you're walking around stiff, you know, that, that takes a oh, lot of energy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm hearing all these things. Well, the same thing is true of our cells. Like we have that that relationship of magnesium and calcium of things going in and out of the cell. So we don't think about that either, but that's huge. That's like everything. Yeah. So it's massive. Um, so yeah, we can all relate to the tension, but we, we don't even realize what's going on inside. Um, okay. So um, types of EMFs, including 5G. So we've got a lot. So we've got what wireless, We've got wireless radiation, which is anything with information traveling through the air. That's from your cell phone. So you got your cell phone, you've got your Wi-Fi router, you've got radio stations, television station towers, um, cell okay. phone networks, satellites beaming down from outer space. <laughs> and you know, there's those old guys that uh that and and ladies that do the old ham radios where you can talk for miles and miles, like hundreds of miles away to, to somebody. Uh, those produce different, uh, you know, types of wireless frequencies. So basically, anything that has information traveling through the air, um, walkie-talkies, you know, that's information, audio, audible information traveling through the air. Baby monitors are another one, and uh, cordless phones. So all of these devices that send information through the air, they use a, they they propagate and send this information with a wireless signal that our bodies act as an antenna for it. And how do we know that our bodies act as an antenna? You can measure it. You know, we have equipment that we use when we come into people's houses to measure your body as an antenna to see what your exposure is and what frequencies are impacting you the most in your house. And, you know, a, a basic example of this that I always talk about is when, uh, you know, 30, 40 years ago, uh, they had television antennas with the bunny rabbit ears. And you would grab onto it and the reception gets better. Well, why does that happen? It's because of the conductance of your skin and all the minerals in your body. 
it's adding to that antenna effect and you're becoming part of that antenna. Now, just because you grab the antenna on the TV, that doesn't mean that you all of a sudden become an antenna. You were already an antenna for that frequency before uh, you even grabbed it. So that, and then mm. sometimes the, the signal that's resonating off your body is so strong. You can just get close to the antenna. Like if my finger here is the antenna, you can just get this close to it and the reception starts to change. Now, what, it, what does that tell us? That tells us that your body is <laughs> resonating out at least that far yeah. with that frequency. And that means it's also resonating inside your body that far with that frequency. And Crazy. that's not, that's something that's not natural that we've never had on the planet before we started adding these frequencies oh, to the surface man. of our earth. So crazy. Okay. So the wireless, you mentioned a whole list. That's a lot. Cause it, like, we're all exposed to so many of those. So does mm -hmm. that also, that's also including the radio frequencies? Yep. Yeah. That's and, radio and frequencies, everything, um, anything with it that you can think of with information that's, that travels through the air. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oof. And then we got the smart meters. <clears throat> yep. Smart meters. They, that, that's part of the wireless too. And they, that's sending information back to the electric company. And uh, some of those, some of the meters on our houses also send information through the wires, which is uh, a type of dirty electricity. So it's not 60 Hertz, like what we would use to turn on our blender that's plugged into the wall at our house. That's a different type but uh, it's, they're pulsing higher frequencies on the electrical lines. So it's kind, that's kind of in between the electricity in our house and the wireless. Interesting. It's, it's in between those frequencies. And we don't actually need these. And we, there's actually, if you really wanna go down the rabbit hole, you can do some research and learn how to get these things off your house. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, there's opt-out and there, there's opt-out, um, programs in many different states. Some states don't have them yet. Um, <clears throat> you, can, you can opt to get them off your house or you can, uh, if it's, you know, sometimes they'll have like, many call it an extortion fee. You have to pay like 10 to 30 to $50 a month just to have the thing off. Oh my gosh. I want to punch something. Okay. Yeah, that's crazy. So, but, but some people aren't aware about the smart meters at all and that they can maybe get them removed. So <clears throat> that's something that some people in my state are working on. Mm -hmm. So if you live in Pennsylvania, reach out. We've got people who know how to work with this. Um, okay. So you, so then there's, I feel like you said cordless towers already. And then, but then what about now we have this whole new age of smart appliances in addition to our phones. Yep. Yeah. So all of the new technology that's coming out, a lot of times, you know, I actually don't know very many people that use it, but it's almost universal in these appliance stores now that they have smart appliances for everything. But but you go around and talk to people and you're like, oh yeah, it's a smart TV, but I don't know any of the functions or how to use, use it or anything. Nobody's right. using it, but they're still putting it in everything. It's like they're they're preparing us for when they're like, oh yeah, by the way, we can track when you open your fridge and and uh, <laughs> when you do the laundry, and we know when you're home and when you're away. We're like a creepy Santa Claus, you know, that's always watching you. Uh, and that's just you know that that's gonna that's really the nature of oh, what I is think is going on. We have this massive surveillance state already, and these smart meters are actually perpetuating the ability and the framework in our whole society where we're opening ourselves up to being spied on in many different aspects our fridges our washing machines our blenders our <clears throat> you know like even even things you use for your baby your baby monitor and, and people putting cameras all over their house and everything the and i just heard something really bad about the ring doorbells as well those are those produce uh wireless radiation as well but they've also got that that camera and so the um, there's just, you know, in addition to the health aspects of EMF, there's also this concern about actual privacy. Yeah, and, for sure. And that's a, that's a big issue um, today. Right.
for sure. That's a whole other like rabbit hole podcast. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when I was a kid, I thought the Jetsons was insane. Like what? That you can like talk to things and you can, and here we are. Right. Um, they were, they were preempting that, huh? Yep. Um, so I want to actually, so you said, um, you've said a lot about dirty electricity. Um, maybe we'll talk a little bit more about some basics about that, but does that, okay, wait, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. There's also the Wi-Fi piece guys. Um, and Brian tell me, aren't we supposed to be able to be given like a fiber way to, um, use our internet? So like, that's what we used to do. And now everybody's it's like wireless, but we can still do it that old way. And isn't that better? Yeah. Yeah. So with with wireless radiation, any reduction in exposure you can do is going to benefit you uh, because of just the massive amount of uh, saturation that we have. And one of the things that I uh, we teach in in the in an EMF course that that we'll talk about later uh, and probably link in the show notes here is that uh, there's really a priority system that you can implement with any solution to any type of EMF. And it's what we call the 3D system. So it's uh, distance and duration, and then, um, and then your downtime. Those are, those are the three priorities that, 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 uh, that matter the most. So um, EMF is most detrimental when you're in a downtime state, when, you're tri- when your body wants to be in a parasympathetic, relaxed state. So that's when you eat, when you sleep, and when you're detoxing. Those yeah. are the most important times to be free of EMF stress. And then duration, like if you're, if you're uh, you know, obviously you're sleeping in your bed, hopefully at least eight hours a night, and that's a long period of time. So you want that space to be as free of EMF as possible. So that's a double whammy for your bedroom. And then the third thing is distance. So the Distance means that the further you are away from the source, the the better that you'll be. So if you happen to be like have a Wi-Fi router in your office, which a lot of people do, that's a really short distance between your body and that emitting source of wireless radiation. So you really need to try to create some distance between yourself if you're going to continue to use the Wi-Fi in that manner. Otherwise, um, you know, reducing exposures in other ways and eliminating them completely, that's, that's the best way to go. And we do have options for wired internet. You, there are still ethernet cables. It's, it's a faster way to, to connect. Okay. And, uh, and I do have a fiber connection here at my home in Idaho and it's super fast. It's way faster than any wireless connection would be. It's a one gigabyte per second. That's good to hear because I think there's like a lie about how wireless is faster that we get stuck on. And we were like, oh, well, that's why I'm not gonna do, you know, the cable version anymore. Um, At least that's what I've taken it to be. Oh, 5G is faster, wireless is faster, blah, 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 blah. So we just like, oh, okay, well, I'll switch to that, right? Um, But I found out that in Pennsylvania, when you sign up for your internet service, you're automatically billed for the fiber option, but they don't send it to you unless you ask for it, but yet you're paying for it. Mm, interesting. I, not, I know. So basically they're taking our money and, and stealing from us. So that's not cool. So, you know, definitely something to, to like pay attention to if you want to make a step in the right direction and get the fiber back in also check your, your, phone bill <laughs> your, your internet yeah well uh, <laughs> they're probably using that to fund the development of the antennas and stuff so they can be like oh yeah we've been charging you for this and so we're going to give you a free year of 5g internet like you know yeah. or whatever there's so many whole, things that they could do <laughs> oh yeah it's like a whole big it's a whole big thing it's disgusting but anyways but yeah so that's something that i'm you know trying to be more conscious of is like these little things we can do, like you said, and I like Mm -hmm. how you broke that down. That's really helpful to three D's. So let's do more of the three D's. So like, can we go into like, 
Okay. What would you say for anyone coming into this to avoid the overwhelm? If they're like, they've never done a single thing. <laughs> what are like the top five, like free things you could literally go today and just take care of in your, in your home? Let's, let's say our home, because that's where we spend most of our time. Yeah. So let's, 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 uh, let's go even break that down even further and, and use that 3d system and Go okay. right in, right into your home now into your bedroom, because that's where it accounts the most. Yeah. That's where you're spending eight hours a night, a third of your life and your body is supposed to be restoring in itself. So right. some of the free things, easy things you can do in your bedroom is keep your airplane, keep your phone on airplane mode at night and don't charge it right next to the bed, charge mm -hmm. it in the bathroom or in the hallway outside your room. If, and and uh, if you need to have it on for some reason, turn the cellular data off so that it's not pinging the towers as much. Um, a lot of people are concerned about not being available because they have kids in college or away or, or, or they're on call for work or something like that. Um, if you're on call or you need to have your phone available, um, either, get, either have a landline that people can call or take your phone out of the room somewhere where you can hear it if it rings, but turn the cellular data off and the okay. Wi-Fi off and the Bluetooth off. That way you can yeah. still get a text or a call if in an emergency and it's, and it's fine. But get the cell phone out of the bedroom, at least put it on airplane mode. If you want your phone next to your bed for your alarm clock, you can get these little batteries, uh, the little battery power banks, and you can charge your phone on the power bank and keep it in airplane mode, Wi-Fi off, Bluetooth off, and then, uh, and then you don't have to worry about the electricity that's coming off the cord from plugging the phone into the wall right next to the bed. Ooh, okay. And you can still, but you can still have the alarm. You can still have the alarm. Yeah. Sweet. That yeah. is so good to know. Because that's one thing my clients all say, well, I use my phone for my alarm and I'm like, there's a workaround. We'll figure it out. So now you just gave us that workaround. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> Pretty all easy. Right. And then. <clears throat> Other things in the bed is like, um, like uh, you can you can order on Amazon or your favorite on, online retailer, battery operated lamps that you can use next to your bed mm. instead of the ones that, that are plugged in. Because when you plug in a lamp, it's bringing in electric electricity closer to your your uh, your body while you're sleeping, and that's going to raise your body voltage, and so that's going to be you're going to be a lot better off if you have things unplugged near the bed. Yeah. And, uh, and then also um, <clears throat> look on the other side of the wall from your bed and see if there's, um, if there's a lot of electrical lines or if you share a wall with, uh, with a, you know, a fridge or something that has a motor running. Something really easy you might be able to do is move the bed to a different wall like usually an outside wall in the house is only going to have maybe one wire going through the wall. Okay. Um, unless you have the electrical panel on the other side, which you don't you want to be on the other side of the electrical panel um, because that's going to bring magnetic fields and all the electric fields from the whole uh, home right behind where your head is when you're sleeping. Right, so your head's close to the electric. Okay, so you want your head as far away from anything as possible. Yeah, and so... And, and sometimes like no matter what, if you, if you push your bed at least a foot from the wall, but the further you push it away, the more distance you have, that's one of our three D's, the more distance okay. you have from the wall, the better. Actually, most rooms would be better served. Uh, if it's not a shielded room, um, it's better, you'd be better served just having the bed right in that smack dab in the middle of the room. And, uh, and <laughs> it's not really how most of our homes are designed to be. Right. But, um, unless you've got that room shielded, the walls become, you know, the, the walls are hot with electricity, even if you only have one wire in them. So the closer you get it to the middle of the room, the, the better, better off you're going to be. And so, you know, practically speaking, some people might not even be open to that idea. Oh, I'm not going to be doing that. Right. Like, right. But if you're in kind of a desperate situation where you're sensitive, you might try it and then see if you feel better. Yeah, I've been sleeping. I'm in an Airbnb and the, the bed is like maybe six inches from the wall, but it's so heavy and huge. So I sleep with my head on the other side mm -hmm. of the bed and everything's unplugged. 
Yeah. That's, Except a few things. Yeah, that's a that's a good that's another good little hack is to just flip around and then you'd have your you know you have more surface area on the top half of your body than the bottom right. half for sure. And then you, you said something in one of our videos we did. By the way, we have a couple videos from years ago, which I recently rewatched. I was like, oh, these are still really good. And you had done in the bedroom, you were talking about our lymphatic system in our, in our brain. So to me, it was like, oh, well, my head needs to, so that's where I went with that. <laughs> yeah. Well, that makes sense, you know, and, and, and for people that, you know, you can go back and watch that video, but basically at night when you're sleeping, your body goes into restore and repair mode. And one of the main things that happens is, is sleep is your brain's chance to kind of rewire itself and and also detoxify all of the beta amyloid plaque and the oxidative stress that's built up over the day from all the stressors that you've experienced and everything that that's that's happened during the day and what happens is when melatonin floods the brain out of your pineal gland at night it uh it sweeps up all the oxidative stress between your cells intracellularly and mops it up and then pumps it down the cerebral spinal fluid into your circulatory system for your uh, kidneys and your liver to, to take care of. But the melatonin also triggers this sh shrinking of the cells in your brain to create more of that intracellular space. Mm. And, and this, this uh, system was discovered not too long ago. I think it was in like 2000, it was between 2011 and 2014, I believe. But uh, University of Rochester, they found out that the brain has this detoxification system called the glymphatic system. And so there's a lot of papers that have been published since then about the glymphatic system, G-L-Y phatic, P-H-A-T-I-C. Yeah, that's good. To, that's good for people to learn about. Yeah. So, okay. So you got two things. You got how we do our phones. Um unplugging things near the bed, uh, checking the wall where our bed is to make sure there's not a lot of dirty electricity. You said something about cordless lamps or battery operated lamps. Do you know a, a name of any or? Yeah, there's a, there's a brand called Hooga, H-O-O-G-A. They have a lamp. Um, Blue Blocks has some, some good uh, battery operated options. Okay. Um, you can even get a power bank and, and uh, get red fairy lights like like for, for the bedroom if you want, if you wanted to do that too. Um, but everything that you plug in needs to be battery operated uh, because that runs on DC and doesn't run, rely on the AC electricity from the wall. Okay. So the, the battery operated um, all run on DC, which is what your body runs on. It's what we're used to. And it's it's not going to have that pulsation. So even if we're doing like a salt lamp or changing out our bulbs for red bulbs in our plugged in lamps, we're still getting that. We're still getting some exposure from the electricity from it being plugged in. Yeah. Even if the light's off, if it's plugged into the wall, it's bringing that electricity closer to you. Dang. Okay. Well, yeah. that's a good, I didn't know that one. That's a good one. And then, um, cause I have the red bulbs, but that makes a lot of sense. So yeah, I don't spend a lot of time at night in my room with lights on. It's just not, I just know, like, I just don't do that. Yeah. But, um, anyways, so that's good. Now I have a question. I think you're going to get to this in a minute is in addition to the changes of anything close to your bed and your lights. So a lot of us are sleeping with machines like for me, it's my molecule air filter, which I saw your video and I was so bummed that it has freaking Bluetooth in it. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about our, our appliances? Yeah. Well, one, yeah. Make sure that if you do have an air purifier, that it's plugged in and set up as far away from your bed as possible in the room. Okay. And, uh, that's number one. If it does have wireless, if you have a molecule or something else, there usually is a way to shut it off. Um, I've heard from some people that the newer molecules are harder to shut off than, than the one that I had in that video. 
Yeah, um, I have two. I have the small one and the big one. The big one was easy, but the small one, I like, what the F? It's like, so I'm working on that one. But but just keeping it further away for now while I figure that out is. Yeah, the, that's that's a lot the, better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then one of the big one of the big things you can do is put your Wi-Fi. If you have Wi-Fi, put your Wi-Fi on a timer so it turns off at a certain time in the night and then uh, the power will turn back on at a certain time in the morning. Uh, or you can just unplug it manually if you if you don't want to do that. But you can get those little Christmas light timers okay. and uh, and use those to <clears throat> to time your Wi-Fi turning off and on as long as you clear it with everybody in the house. Say, hey, Wi-Fi is going off at the this time. Part. That's the part that you really have to work on. That's I have teen boys, so that one's like a battle I'm going to be ramping up for. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the thing is, is like when you have teenagers or, or kids that are getting into their teen years, you, you know, you don't and they have if they have cell phones, then you'd rather them be connected to the Wi-Fi than than using their mobile data. The mobile data actually pulses a lot stronger signal. Mm. And so that's a catch 22 a little bit. But there mm. are ways to wire your phone um, to oh, the Ethernet point. cable as well. And so if you if you're able to set that up, there are these uh, a better option. It's not the best because it does create some dirty electricity on the line. But I, in my opinion, better than Wi-Fi is um, any home can install these if you have electricity and uh, their power line ethernet adapters, internet over power line adapters is what they're called. So if you type in internet over power line adapters online in your favorite search engine, it'll show mm -hmm. up with these devices where you can plug it into the wall and has a little ethernet cable that'll go, go off and that'll plug into your Wi-Fi router with a wire. And then you plug in another one somewhere else and it it takes the the inf the the internet from the router through the cord to this little device and it goes through your electrical line and it'll communicate with this other device through the electrical line wires and then out of that you can have an ethernet cable that goes to any other place in the house okay so, do you have a video on this you need to do a video on this <laughs> yeah i'll do a video on it sometime. but it's really easy to to set up yeah. you just plug it in, you know, plug it, plug this little thing into the <clears> wall, <throat> put the ethernet cable in, plug it into the Wi-Fi router, and then, okay. then find another location where, okay, I want internet right here in the kitchen so I can have a, a wired connection there. And so you, so you just plug the, plug it in there with the ethernet cable and magically it just, you have internet on that, on that wire coming right out of that. It. Yeah, because that we need to like somehow train ourselves not to like always have to be walking around with our wireless smartphones. Like I, I right? So I, I love that. It's it sounds pretty simple and it sounds conducive to the dynamics of different people's preferences too, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. It it helps a lot. Um for especially if you're, you know, ideally you'd have the whole house wired with Ethernet. Um and, but you could do this in the meantime and, okay. and at least and it, also that'd be a good training period getting people in the household <laughs> used to using it yeah. that way and knowing that the wi-fi is going to turn off so you have to start plugging <clears> in <throat> at this time of night um yeah and then eventually be like okay we got rid of wi-fi altogether now we plug in all the time <laughs> So I love this. This is so practical and helpful. Like, so my oldest son doesn't live with me and he has the wire, the router, sorry, in his bedroom. And he's like, well, there's nowhere else to put it. And I'm like, figure it out. So he's not going to figure it out. So I'm curious, what if someone has the router in their bedroom and the way the house is designed, it's like, oh shit, this is the only place. Like it's like an apartment or you rent or there has to be a workaround. Yeah, well, in that case, um, there are Wi-Fi routers that emit less radiation that you can get. They're called eco Wi-Fi routers. Um, I think the brand is JR <coughs> JRS Eco Wi-Fi router. Um, you can look those up, and and uh, they'll produce they uh, pulse like ten times less with less intensity. That's one option. Another option is to just get a piece of uh, shielding fabric 
and drape it over the Wi-Fi router, that helps to dampen the signal. And uh, you could do that in one direction, or you know, in the meantime, you could even take just a cooking pan or uh, like a deep dish cooking pan, put the Wi-Fi router in that, and then just kind of aim it away from the from the area. So, and these are kind of little, I would call them redneck solutions or MacGyver solutions that <laughs> that you do like for transitions because. Yeah. At, with my company, we're we're really concerned about the aesthetics of our, of the solutions that we put in, and so sure. we want we want people's homes to look just as beautiful as they were, or more beautiful than before we came after we install solutions, and so um, that's why we have other products that help block the outside frequencies in the bedroom, including the electricity in the walls. You know, and there's special shielding paints, and then there's um, can't like uh, shielding fabrics that you can sew into curtains or window coverings to cover your windows and and block out all the outside frequencies and the electricity from the walls and and then there's also like canopies you can put around your bed for like a princess type of canopy yeah so what kind of pan is it a metal pan any metal pan yeah okay. that, that would work uh, or you might have some other kind of thing. You just look look around the the shed. You know, you might find some kind of metal object you could use, an old lawnmower, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> That's so random. A hubcap. Um, you know, like there's. Oh, okay. There's there's lots of there's lots of things you could you could come up with, and you can make you could even make a video and act like you're somewhere from the south. And all right, here we're going to take care of this Wi-Fi router here and put this well, in here well we need hubcaps here too so it's not just as <laughs> of it. um that's so funny so okay so you alluded to the electricity outside of the bedroom but is there anything else in the bedroom that we can change control manipulate that we didn't cover yet um well light you know light in the bedroom you want to you, you don't want to have any bright white lights on in the bedroom. If your lamp is like a really cool blue light, you want to switch that to either a warmer white, what I would call a twilight bulb, uh, like the, and some of these uh, really thin filament vintage um, incandescent bulbs, even if they're low wattage, they don't flicker that much because the filament is so thin that it heats up hotter than a normal thicker filament would. So Normally, we recommend higher wattage bulbs um, because they flicker less, but higher wattage bulbs also produce more light. So there's these vintage bulbs you can get that we would call twilight bulbs, and, uh, and those, those uh, produce less flicker, and they have a warmer tone, like a warmer color. And, right. uh, and then, you know, but really, if you're putting something right next to the bed, I prefer either orange or red uh, yeah. bulbs. Yeah. And the reason why we want the low flicker is because in nature, we wouldn't have all the flickering light and it affects us somehow. Yeah. Well, the only, the only time in nature that you would have flickering light is if you're running really fast through a forest or jungle and there's sun going through the trees and then you have this flickering going on. And whenever that happens, you're actually in a very stress and a high stress response you're in a fight or flight uh state so ancestrally even you think about it like flickering light induces anxiety and stress in in the in the human organism and so we need to um create environments where it's more like hey we're sitting on the beach the sun is shining we're relaxing there's no flickering coming from coming from the sun it's this constant beam of of light energy and photons that are just hitting your body and doing all these beneficial things. And so mm. we want to try to recreate the light environment from outside, inside at the right time of day. And that's the key thing is right. making sure that you're matching the spectrum outside with inside. And also knowing that uh, a lot of the lights that we have today, they're pulsating the same rate as the electricity that's, yeah. that's running it. Yeah. And so yeah even though like the light isn't visibly flickering, 
um, you can actually take a slow motion video with your phone and you can see that uh, even if it's not visually flickering in real life, that there's this imperceptible flicker that's happening. And the thing that happens physiologically is your eyes are respond really fast and they try to adjust. Um, they try to constantly adjust to that, but you're, but it's trying to send a signal to your brain and, and, it, and your brain doesn't process those images fast enough to produce the flickering or for you to perceive the flickering, but it creates this eye fatigue. And that's why in a lot of people that go into offices that have artificial lighting, they have LEDs that aren't healthy or they have fluorescent lighting and they're like, man, I feel terrible. I get a headache. Well, guess mm -hmm. what? Your eye is connected to your hypothalamus and pituitary gland right in the middle of your brain. And that, and that uh, stimulation from your eye is going to be constantly sending signals of stress to your brain. And then it's going to start to cause some more inflammation in, in your brain and, and eye fatigue and, and even eye problems. My mother-in-law has uh, eye, eye problems after working in an office for just a few months. And the lighting there is terrible. I can't go into any, I can't even, I don't know how people do it. Like I can't go into those buildings and feel okay. I'm just like, ugh, agitated. Um, when I had my, when I went through my divorce or my split, I it was, I was in trauma and I didn't know I was in trauma, but I was in trauma for a long time. And as soon as it was done, my body's like, kaboom, crash. So I had like what we call reactive hypoglycemia but I also could not go into any large building with bright lights without feeling like I was going to pass out. That's how tanked I was. So it is real. And the yeah. more your health is already struggling, that's going to be one of those frog in the pot of boiling water things again. Right. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. so it's just, it's not to be nitpicky. It's literally like all these things cumulatively add up. So if you can start in your bedroom, then boom. Okay. We got that. Cool. I'm sleeping better. And then, you know, you can move into the rest of the house. Right. Yep. Yeah. And light, light is just, if you have anybody that's skeptical of doing anything in your house or changing any habits of it, of the, of the family in the household, light would be the best one to start with. Yeah. Uh, it's the thing that people notice the most. You can use the slow motion video, ask, you know, get the family involved, ask the family members, Hey, can you take a slow motion video of all the lights around the house? Like we just, I just want to see if they flicker and then we're going to try to change out these bulbs and, and to these new ones that, that Brian recommends. And, and we're going to see if we feel better and yeah. if it comes like an actual cool thing. I mean, if teenagers, anything that teenagers have to do with their phones or people that are more technologically minded, they're like, Oh, cool. I can take a slow motion video of the lights and see if they're flickering. Yeah. And, uh, project, right? It's great. And, and <laughs> the, every, you know, everyone that I talk to loves it. They, and they, they're like, yeah, these flick it's in intuitively, you just know this flicker is not good for us. It's not, it's not something that's natural. Yeah. And, and so it's, that's, that'd be a really great first step to get people involved and then say, you know, just like the lights, there's these other pulsations that are invisible around us that, that, uh, we should probably take care of. And then yeah. you kind of take them on that path. And once the lights have proven themselves, which is a very more, more visible and tactile exercise you can do with, with, the, with technology that people love, then you can move to the invisible things and they're more open to it. Mm, so smart. That's a, good, that's a good way to look at it. So, okay. So we got the top three things in the bedroom. Um, which can also apply to the rest of the house as well, right? To some degree, some of what we said. Um, what are some What are some next steps? So, like, I'm thinking, like, maybe fifty dollar range or something like that, where we're like, okay, we're ready to like get some more solutions in place. Um, oh wait, did we talk about keeping cell phones and and electronics off our body? Yeah, that's another like a what I would call it more transitory habits that you can that you can change. And so, um, you know, have a, you know, have a place for your phone. Don't have random places for your phone, which is what my problem is. It's like when when you're in the house, be like, OK, my phone goes here when I'm in this room and it goes here when I'm in this room. 
and, mm. and actually have a place for it. That way you're not losing it and thinking, man, I have to keep my phone on my body. Otherwise I'm going to lose it. But yes. have homes for your phone in, in each room that, that you go into and just, you know, you can have it on if you need to be available or whatever, but whenever you take it and move it from one location to another, like have it in at its home and put it in airplane mode first and then put it in your pocket, go out to your car, walk down the street. Once you're done transitioning from one place to another, take it off of airplane mode. Yeah, but, that one's going to be a hard one for a lot of people, but it it's is. A, it, it adds up like. I know for me, if I'm touching my phone more in a given day, I feel it. Like I get in my phone hand, let's call it that. <laughs> I feel the tension. I'm like, ah, oh. like, all right. Then I'm like, okay, I got to remember. And it's just a practice. Um, yeah. But like, I think what's so hard too is like then you're carrying your phone on your body like i i have a bag i have a purse guys don't typically have that i have three four sons three live with me so i'm like guys <laughs> you have this thing on your body all the time let's well they have you know the, the right cases but like still we should be um turning it like temporarily here and there intermittently throughout the day we don't need to be on all the time because if you right. think about it, we're on on that all the time like that's the autonomic nervous system which is on right our, our sympathetic side is on as well reacting to that yep. we're never getting a break yeah so we have well, to remember that and practice that somehow yeah. And that's, that's huge. And that's something I probably don't talk about enough is that it's not just the EMF exposure. It's also the habits and, and uh, the addiction to the technology that, mm -hmm. you know, can you like, before we had phones, we would actually go throughout the day and live <laughs> our lives and have a normal human experience. Now it seems like you know, more often than not, somebody is looking at their phone when they're just standing around in a coffee shop or restaurant or, you know, at the airport or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, and we've lost this ability to communicate with one another. And we, yeah. we really need that back desperately as yeah. a species and, and to, to develop community and everything. And it's one of the reasons why we're in the situation we are in the world where everyone's feels so divided and, and polarized. Right. So, um, and the fact that these devices are not only addictive and isolate us from one another, but they cause a stress response while we're doing it and it increases our blood sugar, it's, it's a recipe for disaster, really. And so the more breaks you can work into your day, I mean, there's some apps on phones or some things that are native to like the iPhone where it tells you how much you've been on your phone. Yeah, I I would that's a good one. Yeah. yeah, I would encourage people to use that and try to reduce their time on on their phone a game. turn it into fun like make it a game yeah like co compete with yourself <laughs> <laughs> right oh i get a cookie i i reduced my time <laughs> yeah and, it, and really you might be at a net benefit if you get a cookie every time you reduce your time by like two hours know, or something right? because I your blood because I have, yeah, I know. Because right? your blood sugar would spike more from the EMF exposure and than the cookie. the cookie. And so True. you've actually, you're better you off. Would, you would still have your minerals that help you, um, you know, with your blood sugar in the first place. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, so, so it is a habit. It is worth it. No one else is doing it. So it's going to be like your own, like commitment to you. Right. So like, for me, one of the things I've been trying to figure out is with my kids, like whenever I'm in the car, can we turn off the Bluetooth on all of our phones? Cause it adds up. Could we maybe like put our phones off and talk? Yeah. Novel concept. Right. But like, for me, it's just <laughs> where, where can I start somewhere? And just bring everyone on board in these little ways, like throughout the day. Like, is there a common time place to start integrating some little new habit around this for all of us? And so for me, that's what I've been like trying to figure out, you know, to encourage that connection, like you said, but like 
if our phones are on and we're in the car and we're already getting exposed all these ways, everyone's driving around potentially super agitated, Mm -hmm. you know? And so communication in the car without someone like, I'm playing my game, don't talk to me. And you're like the driver and they're being agitated. And so it's like affecting you and you can't have a conversation. It's like, you know, these things matter and they add up. So anyways, um, so, okay. So we talked about it on your body and creating habits, but I do, I do think there are things that we can purchase as our next step that everyone probably needs to have like a, a cell phone case. Right. Um, they're not that expensive. No, I mean, there's some cell phone cases that are like 10 bucks you can get that are adequate on, oh, okay. on like Amazon. Oh. Um, yeah. So, and it's, it would, it provides protection from radio frequencies. Some of the more expensive ones also block magnetic fields from your phone, which are produced regardless of the of airplane mode being on. So that's another argument for having some kind of pouch I, I always carry my phone around when even if it's an airplane mode, i just hold it in my hand away from my body until i have a place to set it down and so it's got a home in the car it's got a home in my office in the living room and so it's not in your pocket women are putting it like in their in their bra their sports bra or we're even wearing them on, on our arm. arm yep yeah they've got so if you have like one of the pouches like the one we recommend right now is by SYB shield your body. Um, They have one that blocks the magnetic fields as well. And so you could actually put it on your body if it's an airplane mode and it would be um, it's basically like, it's not there as far as the exposure. Um, But most of the, all pretty much all of the cases that you use are going to have, you're still going to have wireless exposure um, just because if if you're going to be able to use it, it has to be able to communicate with the tower. Um, so, you know, there are the Faraday bags you can put your phone in, but you, people like you really shouldn't be putting their phone inside of a Faraday bag if their phone is on because it's just going to drain the battery trying to reach the tower. <laughs> so even in that case, you'd still put it in airplane mode and, and okay. uh, more for security reasons than anything because your phone can track you even if it's on. Right airplane mode with the geolocation yeah we yeah oh yeah that's another so that's good to know that there's ones that are cheaper um do you have like maybe your top three brands i like shield your body um there's one from primal hacker that has a little pouch it's kind of it's a nice one uh if you go to primalhacker.com um we'll probably be coming out with one ourselves in the next year cool. um i used to have my wife make them and yeah, i think i, you, I think you one. had you I still have it. one okay yeah. but uh we have we have a different uh design than most of the other companies that are out there that we're going to be implementing that i think makes more sense with how people are using their phones um and provides more protection but uh yeah those are the brands that i like right now and then if you just want a quick and easy one uh, I'm going to look here real quick. There's a Faraday phone pouch, phone case. Yeah, this, the one I, the one I uh, have ordered in the past is just signal blocking bag. You can look that up online and you'll find one for $10. Nice. And, and you can put that, you know, you can use that um, as a, as a little blocking bag that'll that'll help you when you're care when you're carrying it around. Cool. Well, that's awesome. Um, how are we for time? We've been chatting quite a while. We're good. Um, there was one slide I wanted to share. Yes, um, let's do it. I can do that because not only is there are there solutions that you can implement right away as far as habits go, but I can also show like the let me just uh, share my screen. Oh, can you enable me to share here? Yep. Cool. Um, so there's a, 
there's some, you know, there, there's a good list here that I can show because we've talked about wireless and electric fields and a little bit about dirty electricity and artificial light. But then there's also magnetic fields for appliances with motors, transform, electrical transformers, breaker boxes. And then sometimes there's even wiring errors in, in people's homes that cause magnetic fields throughout the whole house. And those need to, you know, we need to work with an electrician to fix those things. Mm. So um, I just made you the host because I couldn't find the thingy that, so that should let you do it. Okay, cool. Just remember, we got to switch back. Yeah. So can you see this now? Yeah. All right. Are you seeing just the slides? Or the I whole screen? The whole screen, yeah. All right. Well, the whole screen, I'll, I'll make it bigger then. <laughs> there we go. So... These are the common types. We've talked about a lot of these wireless radiation, um, just mentioned magnetic fields, electric fields. That's from the wiring in your house, the Romex wiring and okay. the dirty electricity. That's um, thousands of different frequencies that are riding on the electrical fields in your house. Uh, and those are created from solar inverters and different smart meters and different appliances in, in houses that are designed to dump um, excess voltage and uh, frequencies on the electrical system through the neutral wires usually in the house. And then there's uh, artificial light. We talked about that quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, telluric currents or geopathic stressors. So those are abnormalities in the earth's crust where there's different pockets of uh, minerals and, and ore deposits and things like that, that um, and faults and cracks in the earth's crust that uh, yep. lead that uh, also have water going through and uh, those can be more intense in some areas than others um, so those are some things these are all the things that we test for when we go to someone's house and then we come up with a protocol on how to fix everything and and then uh this this slide this is from a talk this actually all of these slides are from a talk i did for the event and uh an event called the event it was an online <laughs> event and right. yeah just it, it can be confusing Wasn't but uh <laughs> but uh <laughs> the this last slide was something i had to rush through on that and so for anybody that saw my talk they're like oh my gosh i wanted to spend more time on this slide yep well these are you know i, I kind of broke this down in external and internal environment and um so these external solutions are some of the things that Lydia and I have talked about so far, um, swapping out your wireless for wired everything, and then uh, shielding your bedroom. I haven't talked too much about that, but the idea is that um, we have these special conductive paints that shield the wireless radiation from coming in, and are all, these paints are grounded, and so it blocks the electricity from the walls from coming out. So you can put, push your bed right up against a wall in a shielded room and you won't have that excess body voltage coming onto you and impacting you all night long while you're sleeping. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we recommend for all of our customers is to get a shielded bedroom and, uh, yeah. and we have to test to see like what makes the most sense for, for the person and, uh, and make sure that there's not any wiring errors in the house or things that would, uh, would deter somebody from being in that location and spending a lot of money doing the shielding mm -hmm. uh, when there's an, an issue that can't be fixed. And Got when it. we, sh when we shield a room, we want it to be optimal and we don't, we want you to have your best chance of healing and we don't want you to spend like two or $3,000 doing something where you're not, you're not going to see the benefits uh, of it because of another stressor that can't be blocked by the, the shielding that we're doing. So um, we want to make sure that we rule out some things before we do that and then implement the shielding in a way and, and guide the person doing the project through that whole process uh, so that it's optimally done. And uh, so shielding your bedroom and then optimizing your main daytime areas. So where you're spending a lot of time, those are important things to do with EMF exposure. Um, and then a big thing, that people do is they worry about these exposures a lot and that causes stress. Right, right, so right. especially people that are sensitive to these frequencies, there's a lot of people that are uh, 
electro hypersensitive. And so they worry a lot about the exposures and that causes more perpetuates more stress on, on the body and makes things actually worse. Mm -hmm. um, so another external solution here is connecting to nature. So getting sun, as much sun as you can during the day, get outside as much as possible. Um, even if it's for five minutes a time every hour, you know, like um, depending on your schedule and how your breaks are, whether you're working or at home, um, getting outside once an hour at a, for a minimum of five minutes is going to be so good for your body. And then uh, if you can, grounding on the earth with your bare feet, that's, that's an amazing thing to do. So the more we connect to nature, the more our body is in tune with the world that we're living in and our, our external environment. It's even better if the ground is wet. Yes. Yeah. There's wetness provides more conductivity. And uh, I've got several videos on that on my, on my Instagram channel um, of grounding with wet feet versus dry and then grounding in like the ocean. Ocean <laughs> grounding is the very best you can do yeah. because it's got all the salt and the electrolytes in the water that are conductive and the more surface area you get in there. So that if you, the, if you're swimming in the ocean, you've got like the best grounding therapy ever. It's, it's amazing. And then the last thing on the external side is adding light frequencies inside your house. That's going to give you the frequencies that you need that are, that are not, that are not in the house. So a lot of those are near infrared frequencies and, um, that's super important to add incandescent light therapy into your house. So I've got this, this lamp here, and uh, this is a sonic space photon light. And this is adding near infrared frequencies to the room right now. And even though I've got a window right in front of me, that window is actually blocking the near infrared frequencies from the sun. And I can show you that actually. So I've got this meter. Here, and I'll get off of the full screen here so we can see this better. So I've got this meter that measures light frequencies and I'm just gonna kind of point it at the window out here. And you can see that um, the, the sun has, I smashed my finger, that's why this is, it's not black nail polish. That is bad. <laughs> it was bad, it hurt a lot. Wow. So I'll use this finger just because it's prettier. All right, so. <laughs> You've, we've got the blue frequencies here from the sun, but see how that just blocks off right there. It just kind of stops all the red. So normally outside you'd have frequencies where, where the, the red is actually, the near infrared is actually really high because 40% of the sun's energy is near infrared, but here it's blocking out a lot of that near infrared. So when I, when I take a reading here where, where I'm at, I'm actually getting more infrared. See, that's like basically the opposite. I'm adding in that infrared. And yeah. that's, from, that's from the light that I have in here. Cool. And if I just take it facing up, you can see the, the balance spectrum that happens when I have the light in here. So I'll turn the light off and take it again. And that disappears. Huh, cool. So you. So you really want to have this infrared reintroduced into your house in order to have optimal um, a light environment inside. And mm -hmm. this, this near infrared light has recently, it's been discovered that it's, it's so much more important than we realized because um, we know that the, the, near, infrared, the near infrared light uh, actually stimulates the mitochondria to produce ATP energy. That's what the red light therapies are about. That's what the photobiomodulation is about. But one thing we didn't know, or I didn't know until recently, um, I actually was on a call with Dr. Mercola just a few days ago. And he was, and he said, you got to check out my article. I, I have this new article. And so if you, if you're part of his, if you go on his Substack and, or, and, and uh, subscribe to his censored library, you'll see this article um, because it's no longer available on, for free on online. You have to pay like $5 a year or a month or something like that to get it. But um, I can give you the link to the articles that he linked in the article that he has. But 
what it shares in that article is that near infrared light not only helps with ATP production in the mitochondria, but the mitochondria actually helps to produce melatonin subcellularly in the body. And so 95% of your body's melatonin is actually produced in the mitochondria, stimulated by that cytochrome C oxidase uh, um, respiration in, in the cell. And, and that's, that's incredible. Mm -hmm. And, and melatonin is, it's actually used as the body's number one antioxidant and it out helps to stimulate glutathione production as well. I just learned this too, by the way, like in the last few months, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. So like the, this is what we're getting from the sun. And, you know, I've always said whenever I'm on my doing, doing interviews like this, that, uh, no matter what we do, we need to get as much sunlight as possible. We need to try to mimic nature as much as possible because there's all of these synergies and things that we don't even know about that we haven't studied because we haven't thought to study them or to look at this. And there, there's things in nature that are, that your body's doing with nature that we just will maybe have ne never have any clue about all the intricacies and the, the inner workings of how the body's working. Because the human body is an amazing, uh, you know, amazing thing. And it, there's just so many different synergies and interactions that are happening. So that's where that 30,000 foot view point comes in of mm -hmm. how do we mimic nature? How do we recreate this, this environment? Because there's so many things that these EMFs are doing to damage uh, the relationship that we have with nature, things that we'll never discover our whole lives that will be discovered 200, 300 years after we're gone, if the earth still exists. Right, so right, right. <laughs> at this rate, I don't know what's going to happen to ah! the human race, but you right. know, the earth here. will survive, but we might not. <laughs> yeah, we are, we're, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're not on a good path right now, but I, I do have faith that, that, uh, that we're, we're getting somewhere and that people are coming together and things are getting a little better. So let me just share my screen again here. So with that, the external we also have the internal solutions. This can help your body deal with the stress that you inevitably are exposed to. So uh, we did talk a little bit about conscious habits that you can do um, with the transitory, uh, you know, when, when you're doing transitory things with your phone, uh, when you're traveling in your car, turning the Bluetooth off, turning the phones off. Um, because when you're traveling, you're at, your phone's actually reaching out to the towers constantly, connecting to new towers especially when you're on a road trip or something. So it's good to have those uh, devices on airplane mode when you're traveling. But um, some of these internal solutions are also targeted therapy that can help your body deal with damage and that uh, so, so it can heal and repair the damage done by the EMF exposure. So one of those things is like this uh, nitric oxide release workout that Dr. Zach Bush came up with. And basically what that is, is every two or three hours, you have this nitric <laughs> oxide that's built up inside your cells. And uh, if you exercise and breathe through your nose, you're going to liberate that nitric oxide from inside the cell and cause vasodilation and, your, and oxygenation of your whole body and all the blood vessels and, and everything. And so... Um, and the reason that's important for EMF exposure is because if you remember back to the beginning, when we were talking about the cellular reaction inside the cell, nitric oxide, when it's present inside the cell and calcium enters because of this EMF exposure, that's when the peroxynitrite is created. But if nitric oxide is not in the cell because you've done one of these workouts in the last two hours, then there's not going to be nearly as much damage that happens from the EMF exposure. So this, you have an opportunity to release this every mm -hmm. two to three hours during the day while, while you're awake. And so every time that two hours passes and you don't do this, you've lost an opportunity to increase your health and vitality. Wow. And that, so this is something that should be kind of a habit that we get into Okay. Um, is is doing this like when you first wake up and then mm -hmm. and then uh, two or three hours after you wake up and uh, and the video is online you can just look it up nitric oxide release workout dr zach bush in that video he doesn't talk much about breathing through your nose but that will exponentially increase the the benefit 
with uh, nitric oxide. Yep. Okay, nice. And then another thing that happens or another therapy you can do is sauna or heat therapy. Um, in addition to helping you sweat out um, toxic metals and other types of toxins, um, when you have a light therapy sauna, like a sauna space sauna or, or a homemade you know, uh, near infrared sauna, you're getting that photobiomodulation that, <clears throat> that actually helps to dampen down peroxynitrite by increasing BH4 levels. And so, and you're getting also the benefit of the near infrared and the melatonin and everything. So there's, there's just so many things we can do to help minimize the damage that these things should become modern habits because of the modern toxicities that we have. So I want to add one caveat to the sweating factors. We do lose minerals. So people need to be mm -hmm. drinking their electrolytes before and or after depending on you, the individual, how much you sweat, how depleted you already are. Um, so yeah. yeah. So I have a cool electrolyte recipe. I talk about all the time. People can try that. There's a lot of ways you could do it, but it is important to know that because it is, yeah. we need sweat, but we lose minerals in our sweat. So we have to replace it. Yeah, that's huge. And another little hack that I learned, um, from Dr. Mercola with, with the sauna is like, it's, it's not really good for your brain to get super hot. And right. so you can get, uh, one of those head ice packs and about halfway through your sauna session, you know, leave it right outside the door. Just go ahead and put that on the ice pack on your head. And that's going to cool down your brain and, and make it so that you're not going to have the detrimental, uh, side of heating up your brain too much. Yeah. Um, because heating up the brain, you know, for a little bit, it can be good, but you don't want to do it too much, but your body can handle more heat. Was, is there's a time frame though? Like for me, when I was doing even just the spot red light therapy, it was like, don't aim it at your head for more than like 10 to 12 minutes or something like that. Um, yeah, I, I, I personally, that, that may be a good recommendation. I personally just do what feels right to me. And, uh, and I, I, I usually don't go wrong with that. Like you can kind of feel when like, oh man, I'm kind of, this was relaxing, but now I'm kind of getting a little bit stressed. And then I, that's, that's when I put the ice pack on the head and then okay. it feels, then I feel better. So I should probably time that every time and, and try to try to get the ice pack on before I feel that I, way. Yeah. 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 And maybe it's going to be 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's when we need to pay attention. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah. And then light therapy, if you can do heat and light therapy at the same time, I think that's awesome. Uh, because that's, that, to me, that seems more ancestral. Uh, anytime you've, you have uh, heat in nature, you usually have light and vice versa, um, from the sun or from a fire. And then mm -hmm. there's things like, a like a cold therapy that releases many of the same endorphins and the same, ben the same benefits, cold therapy and sauna therapy also are ways to get rid of nitric oxide in the cell, which, which all, all of the, a lot of these environmental uh, internal solutions that we have, things that we can do are, are things that address this nitric oxide issue of being in the cell. So if you, you can replace your nitric oxide release workout with sauna therapy or with light therapy or with cold therapy. So you don't have to be doing the same thing all the time, but all of these, any, basically anything that increases circulation, yeah. there's, there's likely even PEMF therapies that, that, uh, that do this, um, pulsed electromagnetic field therapies, anything that increases, um, circulation yeah. is very likely going to be, um, uh, releasing nitric oxide from the cell to vasodilate because that's what the what nitric oxide does in the in the blood so all of these things are working with nitric oxide and then of course these magnesium salt floats i'm sure that you're a big proponent of these these this is a uh, something that that i think is very necessary for for today to to help another pathway of increasing your magnesium and your relaxation responses in the, in the body but just if you haven't ever done a salt float they just put 
hundreds or maybe even thousands of pounds of this of this uh, mag magnesium salt. I think it's mostly is it magnesium sulfate? Yeah, it's Epsom salts. Mm -hmm. Epsom salts. Yeah. So they put it in this huge tank, and then you just sit there and you float because you don't sink and and you relax and it and there's this sensory deprivation that happens and the the water's warm. It just feels so good and you get out and you're almost like in this zen state and that's yeah. the magnesium that just is like entered into your bloodstream and you're just like you feel really really good afterwards but so many of us are so magnesium deficient this is almost like a necessary thing to do at least once a month um especially if you're dealing with a lot of anxiety yeah i actually have a different hack for people with the magnesium salt floats, which are awesome. And I've done them. Um, it's not always feasible, right? Not everybody has access. It costs yeah. money. So I actually do mineral baths and I actually like yep. to vary, vary the types of things I put in them because the Epsom salt is magnesium sulfate, which we actually don't retain. It actually is more of a detoxification effect. So yeah, we'll get the relaxation benefits immediately, but like we won't actually be able to restore and rebuild our magnesium levels with that form. So right. I like to do the mineral baths with things like magnesium chloride flakes, which mm -hmm. we actually can retain. Um, but then you can also add other stuff too, which helps with radiation, like uh, baking soda, freaking baking soda. Yeah. So oh, that is a um, emergency medical treatment for radiation exposure. Mm -hmm. So we can take that into our own hands in our own home and use it in our baths with, you know, something like Epsom salts or the chloride flakes and partner the two and have this like extra therapeutic, more um, consistent opportunity to relax yeah. and support ourselves that way. Yeah, amazing. We have, uh, we do at home, we have the chloride flakes and we use those and Epsom salts in different ways. And then also those uh, ancient mineral salts. I think those are some that we'll yep. kind of add in there too. Salts, you can mm -hmm. do a lot. Yeah. So unfortunately, most of the places that have the salt floats are just doing the Epsom salts. Yep. Um, I don't know if there is a place that would do magnesium chloride, but that would be interesting if maybe I'll open work. one. Yeah. <laughs> you could probably get a lot better results. I'll have to see what there's a local place here that does them and and there's a, yeah. a lady people that can just, do it at home. Yeah, you can do it at home. Um and uh and you'll get you'll get some good results too. You're just not gonna have as you're not gonna be able to float necessarily you're not in your gonna bathtub. Have the sensory deprivation aspect, but you can create a Zen environment. You can do a, you can do oils. You can just, it can still yeah. do some cool stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. Very, very good. So that's, you know, if you haven't done a salt float, I would still, I would definitely recommend to, to try it out just so you can experience that. And uh, even just for yeah. anxiety and re relaxation, it's, it's amazing. I, it, it will release a lot of the tension in areas where you're holding tension and yeah. uh and just the ability to, to be in a larger tank and float, you're going to get some, some relaxation of the muscles that you wouldn't normally get. But um, as Lydia has just educated us, the mineral effect isn't necessarily going to be as good as using something like magnesium chloride. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, they both have their benefits. Like the, the sensory deprivation is very eye-opening for people to realize just how freaking stressed they really are and how they literally can't relax themselves. I think the experience of that is huge Yeah, because you got to go in there and you got to be with yourself. And right. most people are like, holy shit. I had no idea how freaking unable I was to just be. <laughs> yeah. So it is worth the experience for that. Some people are terrified of that. Yeah. If you're it terrified of that, you need it even more. Yeah. It's neuroplasticity. That's that's one of the things is you need to do things that you normally wouldn't do. Like I need to do more yoga. I need to do more salt floats. I need to sit down with my kids and play games that I think are boring. Like, uh, well, <laughs> you know, yeah. like it helps you. It helps your brain. It does to, to to be more flexible and and it 
and it, and anything that helps your brain is going to help your body to be more flexible too. Yeah. So, um, yeah. and then the last thing I have on this list here is breathing through your nose and to stop mouth breathing. That is extremely important. Uh, when you breathe through your nose, you're increasing nitric oxide in the right places and which is like in your paranasal sinuses and your lungs, which also helps to uh, destroy pathogens like viruses and bacteria. And one of the things that I've talked about for the last two years, that's been very challenging for me because I have a severely deviated septum is whenever I put something over my face that presses on my nose, it forces me more to mouth breathe. And yeah. that decreases my nitric oxide, which makes me more susceptible to viruses and bacteria. And my immune system is more compromised when that happens. And uh, I can, like I had a, a, a head cone scan done just a, a week ago. And my literally like this side of my face, like my, the airway is completely blocked. And so I, I'm, I'm starting to address this, but the buteco breathing, breathing through your nose, stop mouth breathing, that will help to, uh, if you're young enough and you don't have a deviated septum, it'll help to prevent having some kind of airway issue when you're, when you're older. And also, I just want to say this, because this is so important that if you have crooked teeth and you're thinking about getting braces, avoid extractions at all costs, because if you if you uh, if you have an orthodontist that extracts teeth and then tries to straighten them by pushing them in and creating space, it's going to close that airway. You're going to get a lot less nitric oxide, a lot less blood oxygenation because of that. You're going to be more likely to mouth breathe and you're going to be more susceptible to EMF stress because of your breathing habits that happen because of how your face is just all crunched in and your airways are not clear and you're more likely to yeah. mouth breathe. So Absolutely. this is a, a definitely a more holistic approach <laughs> to, uh, to EMF <laughs> mitigation and, and addressing this issue, but everything is related because really what we want is this optimal human environment and optimal human habits that we need to develop in order to deal with the modern stressors in our environment and EMF, which is a huge environmental stressor of our day. Yeah. So that was the slide. So if there's anything else we want to cover uh, at the end good. here, we can do that. Yeah, no, it's good. Um, so much. And, and like, I'll even just say, I'll just piggyback because I do, you, you guys know, I do the mineral balancing work with clients and that in and of itself is similar in that we take a whole approach, you know, to your life. And, um, there's more in here, what you've shared that I obviously don't specialize in. So I appreciate that, but like just starting to do something, you know, in the right direction is going to take you down this path of like, Hey, let's, let's, um, create a whole new lifestyle around health. And it's not what it's not the way the world has been created modern society. So, um, you know, it can feel overwhelming. Like we said at the beginning, it can feel like a lot, but, um, you know, those baby steps, you know, lead you in the right direction and getting your minerals on board is huge because you're losing them constantly. Um, so yeah, so there's, there's so much we can do and that puts the power back into our own hands and gives us, you know, this like sense of like, I can, you know, in light of the way the world is, unfortunately, yes. Um, look at how much I, I can do and yep. what I can create my life to be. So I appreciate everything you shared. Um, I had a lot more questions, but I, I don't want to take too much more time because I think a lot of my questions might be answered in, you have an online course. Do you want to talk about that for a couple of minutes? Yeah, sure. So I partnered with uh, Nick Pano. He calls himself the EMF guy. So, and uh, we created this course called the Electro Pollution Fix. And so you can find that at the electropollutionfix.com. And, uh, and basically, we take people through like practical steps on how to address these, uh, the different types of EMF step by step. 
and yeah. we kind of give some education on it where there's practical homework. It's not your typical like, oh, I'm going to take this. It's not like an online summit or, or something of that nature where it's a presentation. We're like, actually, there's modules and you have homework and you do that. And then there's a list of, th of steps that you take at, at the end of each module. And so it walks you through. And basically at the end of it, um, you've done everything that you can do. And then you're ready for like the big next step, which would be to have someone like, like us come in and, and create a, a professional protocol for, okay, how do we address the big issue in, in the house, these, the big stressors, now that you've taken care of everything that you can take care of. Awesome. And, and it's, uh, which is something that we kind of need to come to grips with in our society is that this it's the wireless radiation is only going to get worse so we need to start setting up our homes in ways where we have a permanent solution in place so we don't we can move on from worrying about emf and get on with our lives right because i think that so many people are like hey, i'm so worried about it it's this is you know they're, they're increasing this this and that but how much less would you worry if you've already done all of these things and then had a solution put in place in your house where you're protected. Right. Like you're putting, you're giving your power away by focusing on what they are doing. Yeah. <laughs> and you can be like, no, well, what can I do? I can do stuff. Well, let me do it. Yeah. So, so it's like, <clears throat> it's like basically a, the, the course is a path on give, giving you the for, most affordable solutions on, on things that you can easily change right away from lighting to wireless to wiring errors in the house, magnetic fields, electric fields, dirty electricity, all these things uh, that you can do step by step, how to get your family on board. I have a whole talk on, on, uh, on how to talk to skeptics about it, how to, how to get skeptics in your house on board. Nice. Um, I think we even have a, a thing with, with uh, kids, like what do you do with, with kids and teenagers and things like that? So those are, you know, we've tried to make it very practical so that it's easy for people to make, make changes and you can do it at your own pace as well. I love it. That's so needed. That's perfect. Yeah. So like, there's a lot just from today that people can actually do mm -hmm. too, right? Like yeah. if you want to, if you want to like, not be like the I like to call it like going to the buffet and piling up your plate so high, you can't, you know what I mean? Like we got to stop doing that. We got to like take what we're consuming and digest it and actually use it. So like, yeah. I encourage everyone who's listening today, like you probably have three to five things at least you could do start to implement, um, put in place. You can take this course that Brian has. I'm definitely going to do it. Um, I know people who want that too, like in my health and freedom collective group, a collaborative group, they're asking for this. Like, they're like, can we, let's all get together and like do this together and like meet and talk about it. And so like people are, are definitely um, wanting these solutions. So do your due diligence, take some kind of action today. Lots of links provided here, uh, books, <laughs> so much. And then you've got this awesome course. I'm so glad you put that together. I was like, I think I maybe thought of that back when we were talking way, way long ago. I was like, we need your course now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Cause not everyone's ready to invest in the, in those permanent solutions. Cause you know, we, some people have to save and plan and things like that. So it's yeah. so cool that we can, we can do a lot now. Um, yeah, there's so much you can do right now. And, and then, you know, I think a lot of people have kind of like the last two years thought about where they want to live. And a lot of people have moved and they're like, yeah. I want to settle down and hunker down because of what's going on in the world and all the uncertainties. And so um, there, it, that, that, that presents an opportunity to invest in your home and make it a healthier space so that you can actually because once you take care of the, these problems and you don't have EMF stress uh, bombarding you while you're sleeping, sleeping is the number one healing time for your body to replenish and rejuvenate. And so yeah. it, it, it increases the chances that anything that you're doing for your health is going to work better if you're sleeping in a place that's shielded from these, these stressors. Yeah. And, and it's a, it's a, it's kind of a, it's a big investment, but not more than a sauna. 
not more than a lot of different therapies that people spend money on. And oh, yeah. people like, spend like 15, 20, 30 grand remodeling their kitchen. Right. And it, it costs like a third of that or less, you know? Okay. So um, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, and, and this is for your health. And it's something that you'll be doing every single night. You get this eight hours of healing therapy that is inevitable. You, yeah. you know, that's, I always tell people like, you have problem with follow through and uh, uh, when you're working with a lot of nutrition clients and, and everything, but like, how do, how do you get them to continue to take the right supplements at the right time or eat the right food? That's hard, but it's not hard to say, just go sleep in that room. <laughs> it's like, they're going to sleep somewhere. They're going to, and if you have the room protected, yeah. then they're going to, they're going to do it. So it's like compliance is, is really high when you create a space that's healing versus trying to teach someone habits and especially with children and teenagers it's it's a uh, super important to be able to create that for them yeah that's a good point well with that i think we definitely covered a lot and um yeah so good i mean i we could talk all day i'm sure but um so you've got you got the core. So we'll make sure people are aware of that. And then, you know, when you're ready, you can consult with Brian to come to your home and figure out more, um, deeper household, uh, solutions as well. So you can definitely check out his website, shieldhealing.com for that. I know you have like four or five of you traveling all over the U S for that. Yeah. I have a, about five, I have five people that I've trained that are very amazing individuals and they they're very knowledgeable as well and uh yeah we go all over the united states continental united states been to hawaii been to mexico i haven't been to canada in the last two years but we hope to come there soon Someday. Um, yeah <laughs> but, oh boy uh, yeah there's a there's a but we travel frequently to texas florida uh, Washington, California, Georgia, Ohio, Ohio <clears throat> excuse me, and, you know, Pennsylvania, we've been there a lot in, in the East Coast, up and down the East Coast, usually every place within the continental US, we come at about one, once or uh, once every other month about. Cool. Yeah. Well, good to know. So well, that was a lot. I feel good i'm i hope you guys have learned a lot and feel more equipped to take action um and check out all these great resources and maybe we'll we'll do a part two at some point because i have more questions i think once we get some of this basic stuff in there's other things too like people might want to do when they're out of their home and that's kind of yeah another conversation for maybe another time so for sure well, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. I'm look, looking forward to hearing what people um, learn from this. And do you have a last, anything you want to leave people with? Like a, a little mantra or something? Something. <laughs> I'd say just stay positive and uh, support one another. And, uh, you know, try, you know, there, there is a lot of information. It can be overwhelming to listen to like a whole uh, talk on EMF, especially if you knew nothing about it beforehand. But um, just take one thing and, and start to start to try it. Something like turning off your Wi-Fi at night, and and see how you feel. That's a that's a good first step, a good challenge. And and uh, just set a goal, have it have that in mind, and implement it right away and do it. And I think yep. you'll you'll see that you'll you'll start to see some differences. Yeah, like what's your buy when today? Yeah. I'm going to do it today. <laughs> Tonight, try something, try something, even a little thing, you know, even if it's just taking your phone around your house and testing the light bulbs, just start somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. It's worth it. It's so fun. All right. Well, thank you so much, Brian. I really appreciate it. And um, that's it. All right.